so normally this is the part where I do an introduction and a little bit of history lesson on today's subject, but I mean, it's Ghostbusters. How badly do I need to introduce the Ghostbusters? When it was released in 1984, Ghostbusters made the idea of facing up against supernatural threats with science look so damn cool. The cast was dorky but likable, the equipment looked and sounded amazing in use, and the monsters were wild, crazy and creative. It's no wonder that it quickly became a massive franchise with a sequel, video games, toys up the wazoo, and of course, a cartoon show. Now, I already covered the other Ghostbusters cartoon from Filmation years ago, which was based on an old live-action series and was the main reason that the movie-based show had to change its name to the real Ghostbusters. So, if you want to know more about that whole thing, you can go watch that video. Or, uh, don't. It's really old at this point and it probably kind of sucks. But the real Ghostbusters, though? That's something I never watched as a kid at all. See, I was born in 1989, so strictly speaking, the Ghostbusters craze was before my time. I mean, hell, my first exposure to the idea was the Extreme Ghostbusters cartoon from the 90s, which I've also covered before, but that doesn't mean the base concept wasn't just up my alley as a hot-blooded, monster-loving 90s kid. I've seen a chunk of episodes as an adult and loved them, though, and looking back on the franchise's history, this show is clearly a big part of what kept the Ghostbusters alive. When no more sequels were being made and the video games started fizzing out, nostalgia for the creativity, animation, writing quality and spookiness of this show kept the little gang in people's collective minds when nothing else was doing it for them. Well, except for that part where the producers really started smelling money and things went downhill for the cartoon, but that's another story. Now the Ghostbusters are once again relevant, with Afterlife being a success, Frozen Empire being in theaters and the 2016 movie... ...existing, and it seems like a perfect time to talk about the cartoon. But this cartoon ran for a good five years and amassed 140 episodes, so as much as I want to, I can't just sit and binge the whole thing for a video. But then I had a thought. The show is fondly remembered for its creative monster designs and for actually being rather genuinely spooky for a kid Saturday morning cartoon in the 80s, at least in the early seasons. So I went online, typed in scariest episodes of real Ghostbusters and crammed together all the lists I found, until I ended up with three episodes that we're gonna watch today. Will we not be afraid of no ghost? Will busting make us feel good? Will that line ever stop sounding vaguely pornographic? Only one way to find out. Let's go! Our first episode is the season 2 opener titled Knock Knock, where a bunch of contractors are currently working on expanding the New York subway tunnels. That is, until they dig their way to a peculiar looking door. Do not open until doomsday. Maybe. Maybe we ought to do like it says. Are you nuts? We've got a subway tunnel to dig. We're not gonna stop just cause some nut door says so. Dude, what are you talking about? If my door started talking to me, I'd curl up crying on the floor and question reality. Well, they should have listened. Once the door opens, out pours an absolute tidal wave of ghosts. Even the trains themselves start turning into creepy-ass worm creatures that could give the dune sandworms and the graboids a run for their money. The subway system? Messed up? How can you tell the difference? Man, I don't even live in America, much less New York, and I can still relate to this joke. Also this? This is the best Janine, and the producers who demanded they change her were old crusty cowards too chicken shit to accept the idea of a woman having more personality than how they perceived their mothers when they were five. A controversial Ghostbusters hot take if ever there was one, I know. Anyway, off the Ghostbusters go to investigate, hopping onto the first monster train that stops by. And that's when we get our first actually pretty spooky moment. This could be very helpful. From what I've been able to figure out, the center of the disturbance is ten miles down the line. This should take us there in minutes. Terrific. Oh yeah, I'd say this is a pretty accurate representation of how I feel taking the subway in the morning. There's too many people, they all look dead inside and out, and they all insist on invading my personal space. The only difference is that when I start blasting, suddenly the police shows up to take my weapons away. After some rad as hell scenes of the ghost train zooming through New York, they all arrive at their destination. Peter then immediately proves that he has never seen a single horror movie ever as he approaches a mysterious lady at the station. But uh, maybe you'd better let me escort you outside. It's not safe in here. Nasty, nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. Say now, uh, when was the last time you saw your dentist, hmm? <laughs> okay, lady, chill for a second. It wasn't that funny. According to the stone, at the far end of this tunnel, there's a doorway into the nether regions. The nether regions? What the hell is my junk doing at the end of a New York subway tunnel? 
Okay, to be serious, the stone reveals that the door was a Sumerian doomsday door, and that unless the Ghostbusters close it soon, it will gradually transform the world around it into a ghostly wasteland that just keeps spreading till it covers the entire Earth. Hence the whole don't open until doomsday thing. As the Ghostbusters make their way deeper into the ghostly tunnels and the world continues to get more ghostly on the surface, they eventually meet this lovely fellow. All new spirits must pass through there! But we're not dead. Nobody's perfect! Oh, and by the way, no one still alive has ever come out of there in one piece! See, I knew I wasn't gonna like this. Well, come on. Have a nice day! Um, thanks? What a nice guy! More random nonsense happens, including the obligatory MC Escher sequence so the animators can flex their art history degrees, and they finally find the core of the ghost invasion. Egon reasons that they have to hook their proton packs to the power source itself to get enough power to suck every ghost back inside, which will close the door, but also runs the risk of trapping the Ghostbusters within it forever if they don't manage to escape at the same time. Egon, you kidder! I'll bet you knew this all along and just didn't tell us, am I right? It's our only chance! But I figured if I told you the whole story, you wouldn't want to do it! That's a terrible thing to say, Egon! You're right, of course, but it's still a terrible thing to say. It's true, but he shouldn't say it. Well, despite some gravity fuckery, the Ghostbusters thankfully do manage to suck all the ghosts back and escape, closing the dreaded doomsday door behind them. And it once again leaves us with a warning. Hey, that was great. Really great. Can we do it again? Do not open until doomsday. It was just an idea. Oh man, am I glad to be home. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. So, so you just left the door down there? You didn't like put up a barricade or tell the New York subway workers to dig around it or toss a cave in or something? Any rando can walk up and open it now? I guess we better hope that no homeless people ever go searching for a place to take a piss. Well, aside from a cute little interaction where Peter feeds Slimer some pizza, that's the end of the episode. Well, it definitely has its moments as far as scarier episodes go, but also... Not really? Don't get me wrong, I get that we're going by 80s kids show standards here, and there are some inspired moments. Like, say, the creepy river of the dead or the train sequence, which probably would have skipped me out back in the day. And I love the idea of a literal doomsday door being opened too early. But this does what so many other horror cartoons for kids do. It just throws as many monsters on screen as humanly possible in 20 minutes and hopes one of them sticks out in your mind for a few seconds. Even as a kid I didn't really like when cartoons did this. I'd rather have one strong, well-built up antagonist than just have Halloween decorations thrown on my face every 5 seconds. Even if those Halloween decorations look awesome. But that's a super small gripe, all things considered. The episode is still beautifully animated, bursting with creative energy, and incredibly fun. When it comes to 80s cartoons, this is some top-shelf stuff. The real Ghostbusters will return after these messages. We now return to the real Ghostbusters. Next up is The Thing in Mrs. Faversham's Attic, which immediately starts out way creepier, as an old lady named Mrs. Faversham is haunted by terrifying screeches and cackles coming from her attic. Seeking out the Ghostbusters, the lady explains that she has never actually been in the attic her entire life, under strict instructions from her father. She has just kind of lived with noises like that all that time, but now she can't take it anymore. And when she says that she has no money to pay for their services, well, that's when Peter makes up an excuse to waive the fee entirely. You okay, Peter? Hmm? Oh, oh, sure, fine. I got my quote of Slimer, I'm set for the day. Besides, she reminds me of my mom. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, that's really sweet. It's really nice to see Peter having a heart on occasion. Weirdly, the Ghostbusters find no PKE activity anywhere in the house, even as they go upstairs and find the attic much larger than it should be. But then the PKE meter suddenly shorts out and- OH GOD! Uh... Uh, I think you might have a peeping Tom there, guys. Well, shit hits the fan faster than you can say proton pack, as the various junk in the attic suddenly comes to life and starts attacking the Ghostbusters. And when Peter stumbles into what I can only describe as a garbage scarecrow, it has this to say. Faversham. Yes, I remember. Must destroy Faversham for what he did to me. Destroy! Destroy! 
So, you know, it seems like there's a little bit of a grudge here. Managing to blast their way through more garbage golems and escape the attic, the gang goes back to the firehouse to question Mrs. Favisham about her childhood. Here's your tea, Mrs. Favisham. Thank you, dear. You're terribly sweet. Thanks. At least someone appreciates me around here. We do appreciate you, Janine. We love you. It's just that, like, well... All great loves, you know, it, it improves with distance. You think it'd do any good to slug them? Business before pleasure, Janine. Hey now, hey now, there are plenty of people out there who make good money combining both. Don't be so judgmental, Egon. We were never very well off, but my father had always worked so hard never to deny me anything a girl could want. Oh, he came to America with nothing but five dollars in his pocket, and all he could afford was a measly two-story mansion with its own attic. Oh, we were terribly destitute. But tell me a little bit more about your apartment, my dear. Not that I really wanted much. Oh, Jesus! Somebody contact the Neo-Tokyo police force. I think one of the espers escaped. According to Mrs. Faversham, her father wanted her to have the best in the world, and on one stormy night, he went up to the attic, only to come back down looking terrified, and made her promise to never, ever enter the attic for any reason. Having put the pieces together, Egon then asked Janine to take Mrs. Faversham somewhere else so he and the guys can talk in private for a moment. Come along, Mrs. Faversham. I'll show you where they figure out new ways to do stupid things. What, you mean like Congress? <laughs> so Egon has figured out what we all probably guessed. Even though the episode never says so directly, Mr. Favisham straight up summoned and struck a deal with a demon, and then sealed it up in the attic when he realized that he couldn't control it. Pretty ballsy stuff for an 80s cartoon, all things considered. The thing doesn't actually seem to realize that 70 years have passed since then. So, since it's all-powerful in the attic, the Ghostbusters plan to dress Slimer up as Mr. Favisham and lure the creature to the attic door, so they can blast and trap it from there. Smart thinking, honestly. And judging from the thing's reaction when it sees Slimer, it works. So long have I awaited you, Favisham, here in my prison. Do you like it? I built it all myself. Every inch of it has the word hate. Written on it. That is how much I hate you for keeping me here. Only one thing has kept me from going mad. Revenge. Revenge on the one who had imprisoned me. Whoa, whoa there, Harlan Ellison. Take it down a notch, will you? Having a mouth doesn't mean you must scream. Despite the thing seeing through Slimer's disguise and taking its true form as a weird ghostly tornado, the plan still does ultimately go off as Slimer escapes down the hatch and the Ghostbusters finally trap the thing. So, Mrs. Faversham can now enjoy a peaceful house. Heck, they even give her back her childhood teddy bear. How it even got up there when the attic has been closed off for three quarters of a century is anybody's guess, but whatever. A thankful Mrs. Faversham invites the Ghostbusters in for tea, but they all get a distress call and have to decline, much to her disappointment. And that's when this episode of an 80 section cartoon suddenly decides to give us one of the sweetest endings I've ever seen. She's all by herself, Ray. I know, Peter, but there's nothing we can do about that. It's just that my mom, she spent so much time alone, I never got to... Can you guys handle this job without me? No problem. We'll catch up with you at the station later. Take care, Peter. Actually... I think I'd love a cup of tea. Hey, Mom, hi. Hi, yeah, I was just wondering, um, can I come over for dinner tonight? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll see you then. Love you. Look, you can call me an old sap if you want, but I'm not even joking when I say that this might be one of the sweetest endings I've ever seen to a Monster of the Week cartoon episode. I love everything about this. So many people tend to forget that, despite everything, there is actually more to Peter as a character than just Bill Murray's snark and horn dogging. And it's nice to see some corners of the Ghostbusters universe remembering that now and then. And let me just be clear, 
I love everything else about this episode too. Yeah, you could argue there's a bit of key jangling with the random toy soldier attack, the Slimer shenanigans and the trash golems to keep things interesting for the kiddies, but for the most part, this episode does everything right. It's a self-contained story, it stars an immediately kinda cliché but unfailingly likable character, builds up a credible, threatening villain in creepy ways, and has a deeply satisfying conclusion. And it does it all within one attic in one house, proving that not every bus needs to focus on a world-ending threat in order to be exciting. And speaking of exciting, there's still one more episode left for us to watch, and it's one of the more infamous ones. I am of course talking about... The Boogeyman Cometh. Ah! The real Ghostbusters will return after these messages. Ooh. We now return to the real Ghostbusters. The episode starts with a bit of a cold open as the Ghostbusters catch a mobster ghost and later discuss the creation of an experimental weapon that Egon calls a ghost bomb. Gee, I wonder if that will come up later. That night, however, the Ghostbusters are woken up from their sleep by surprise customers. A pair of children who claim the Boogeyman lives in their closet. Peter once again shows his nicer side by rejecting their payments and insisting that the gang at least hear them out. Which is probably good considering these children apparently left their home at night time without their parents' knowledge and ran through the city streets of New York unsupervised in their jammies just to reach the firehouse. Yeah, these kids are lucky to be alive at all, so I'd say they've earned at least a little bit of attention. Naturally, the gang has a bit of trouble taking the idea of the Boogeyman seriously. Except for Egon, who is uncharacteristically tense about it. Somehow not waking up their parents despite bringing four adult men carrying buzzing backpacks and wearing heavy boots into an apartment building, the kids take the Ghostbusters to their room. And that's when all hell suddenly breaks loose. It's him. <laughs> Look, I I'm sorry. I know he's a really popular villain, but really? Look at him. I can't take this guy seriously. He looks like the Joker had a drunken one-night stand with Boar from the Dictionary and Finale. And before you judge me for knowing a bit of demonology, fuck you. How I spent my Sabbath is none of your business. But honestly, I can't imagine how anyone can take this character seriously. I remember you. Okay. Okay, it's 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 just liquid. That'll that'll wash out easy. That on the other hand might leave a stain. Okay, I take it all back. This guy really makes the goofy design work. He's terrifying when he wants to be. Look at some of the faces he pulls in this episode. Jesus! Also, can we talk about how well these parents take the fact that there are four strange adult men in their kid's room at night after the Ghostbusters manage to repel the boogeyman? I'm sorry to have to tell you that you've got what seems to be a Class 7 repeating corporeal entity residing here. Or, in layman's terms, the boogeyman lives in your closet. <laughs> I see. Thank you so much for stopping by. Why don't you leave? Now. Yeah, we'll be sending a bill for the wall you torch to your office. So, okay, the boogeyman is real. That's a problem. Egon reveals that he has faced him as a child before, which is what prompted him to research the paranormal in the first place. Now he wants to take out the boogeyman for good using the ghost bomb from earlier, but since they understandably aren't allowed in the Carter's homes anymore, and not every closet leads to the boogeyman's realm, they got some searching to do. They do eventually find and rent a ready-looking apartment that does have a closet leading to the boogeyman's world. Peter then comes up with a plan to lure him out by making the apartment look like a child's room. We've only got one problem. We need someone to sleep here tonight who can pass for a child. Someone whose thoughts, actions, and general state of mind are identical to, say, a six-year-old. Oh, dopey. Uh, something I can do for you guys? <laughs> Now don't start feeling too bad for Ray. He gets to have a bit of fun with it. I want a glass of water. Here, now go to sleep. Peter! What? Tell me a story. <laughs> That's right, Ray. Get his ass. Well, turns out it actually works. The boogeyman appears and the gang manages to follow him into his... MC Escher realm. Really? Again? Did every cartoon writer in the 80s and 90s attend the same lectures or something? But who cares? It's time for the world's grooviest chase scene! Yeah! Don't get him, 
Ghostbusters, bust the boogeyman. Yeah! <laughs> okay, I like this kid. Get him! Get him! The chase seems hopeless as the boogeyman can change the realm to impede them, and Egon finally comes up with a new plan. His idea is to hook up all the proton packs to the ghost bomb and blow up every single closet so that the boogeyman will be trapped in his own world. The problem is that this essentially leaves the Ghostbusters defenseless, and the boogeyman decides to open the door to the Carter children's room so they can watch him kill the gang. What a fucking freak. But, emboldened by Winston's advice that the boogeyman can't hurt them if they don't fear him, they decide to bite back with the kind of savage insults that you only hear from young children. Hey, boogeyman! You don't scare me! Yeah! You look stupid! Your head's too big! No, that's the thing I'm sensitive about! And you've got bad breath! Thanks to their mastery of the vicious mockery spell, the Ghostbusters sit off the bomb and leap out of the Carter children's closet, just in time for the Boogeyman to be trapped forever. Well, until it gets a sequel episode anyway. The parents finally believe the kids and allow Egon to tuck them in. And then he immediately takes it a step too far. Thank you. Okay, buddy, we already caught you guys creeping around in our kids' room without our knowledge once. Don't push your luck. So that's the Boogeyman Cometh, and man, I can totally see why this one is so popular. I've seen pictures of the Boogeyman before, and like I joked about, couldn't imagine why people said he was scary. But I totally see it now, at least by kids' show standards. He doesn't actually do anything all that bad other than stand around and snarl, though, and defeating him with insults and marbles kind of makes him come off as less of a real threat. But I can't deny the guy's pure presence. It's no wonder he got a sequel episode, or that he was considered to reappear in Extreme Ghostbusters. Now I'm just trying to imagine how fucked up he would have been in that show. <laughs> but still, it's a fairly unique take on the Boogeyman, the Ghostbusters' plan to deal with him are pretty creative, and it's all around a solid episode. Of the three episodes that we just watched though, the thing in Mrs. Faversham's attic is by far my favorite. No contest. It's just an absolutely perfect blend of spooky, fun, action-packed, and sweet. I might not agree on two out of these three episodes necessarily being the scariest the show has to offer, but I can definitely see why they're also considered some of the best. They're a testament to the show's wild energy, and they remain great spooky fare for both kids and Ghostbusting fans alike. And with that said, I hope you all enjoy Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Be mindful of invisible men sleeping in your bed, and see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Hello, my junior Ghostbusters, and thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to click the like button and leave a comment about some of your own favorite real Ghostbusters episodes, or maybe some extreme Ghostbusters episodes. Why not? As always, special thanks go out to Andreas Wilsom, Half Cryptid, Pocket Mouse, Eleanor Strohel, John G. Robinson, John Aldjets, The Danish Penguin, Warren Miller, and Silvermoon Ravenwolf, as well as anyone else who supports me on Patreon. I can't stress this enough. I really appreciate it. Thank you. If you would like to support me as well, you can find a link to this Patreon in the description below, as well as a link to my Discord server, which you're more than welcome to join. And if you're new to the channel, don't forget to click subscribe for more videos about weird media in the future. See you there, folks, and bye-bye. <laughs>